I did, I did uh, let everybody know last weekend that Pastor Gus was preaching this weekend. Um, but just before five yesterday afternoon, I got a message from Gus saying that he had been listening to the Premier's address to Tasmania because of the lockdown that has happened in South East Queensland and he just so happened to have been in Queensland <laughs> on the 17th, which is when it all started. So the Premier said that anybody who was in South East Queensland from the 17th of July onwards has to stay at home for the next three days, which meant at five o'clock yesterday afternoon, I had to pull together a message Piece of cake. I actually, I'm thinking I might do this every single week because I had the most relaxed Saturday I've had for a long time. Saturday is my preparation day, and I kind of like spend most of the day on Saturday preparing for Sunday. Um, and yesterday it was just I laid around on the couch and read a book. You know, it was just really cool. Then I get a message from Gus. I read it. <laughs> I was like, you got to be kidding. So, question is, if anybody here today is visiting from Queensland. South East Queensland, and you were up there prior, oh, after the seventh, oh, from the seventeenth of July onwards. Please leave the building. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, you. Uh, um, so today is a. I'm taking a little bit of a detour from my message. If I could have that on the screen, Aidan, thank you. I'm taking a little bit of a detour from the series that we were preaching, um, and. I'm hoping that this will actually speak to people who are here in a very special way. I think that uh, weekends like this, they don't, they don't stress me as much as they used to when I was younger because I have a firm conviction that God knows exactly what he's up to and is able to rearrange things the way he wants it. So I'm thinking that somebody here well, probably all of us actually, need to hear this particular message. Now, over this year, our theme has been growth, your personal growth. And the reason for that has been um, our desire that all of us would be growing in our expression of Jesus. Not necessarily just in our knowledge of Jesus, but in our expression of Jesus in whatever situation we find ourselves, whether we're at work, whether we're at home, whether we're in our communities, whether we're mixing with our friends, that people would see more of Jesus shining out of our lives. Because the truth of the matter is, for the majority of the world, the only Jesus that they're going to see um, until they meet him is the Jesus that they see in our lives. And we just need to get a little bit better at showing Jesus to the world around us. I don't think there's anybody here who would argue that there isn't some room for improvement in their life. Mine included. We have to continually be growing in our love, in our compassion, in our peace, in our patience, in our kindness, so that the world would actually get a picture of what Jesus is like. Unfortunately, in the past, there have been times where the church collectively hasn't necessarily demonstrated the love of Jesus the way it should. And sometimes the media makes it even worse. The reality, I think, is that when people get to know Christians um, personally, they're always quite surprised that the monster that the media has pre presented at times is nowhere like the kind-hearted, wonderful people that Christians actually are. Even the weird ones. They're still pretty good as well. I mean, every family's got a crazy auntie or an uncle, haven't they? <laughs> There's about six or seven of them in this room. No, no. We've all we've all got that we've all got that uh, that relative, you know, that we're kind of like, going, oh, <laughs> when we have a family dinner, we don't want anybody else to come. You know, it's like we don't want them to meet them. But anyway, um, I think. Look, to be honest with you, I think Christianity gets a bad rap. Uh, but that aside, uh, we shouldn't rest on our laurels. We should constantly be be pushing through and pushing on in our growth. Now. Which brings, I mean, growth in itself, I mean, I, I think there are some people that pursue growth just in itself, but growth in itself really isn't the aim. The reason that we want to grow is because we want to, as I said, show Jesus to the world, and our desire is that we be all that God wants us to be. And a question that I sometimes ask myself is, how does God 
define success. When God looks at your life, does he see a successful life or does he see a life that's struggling? How does God define success? I mean, if God is the author of all life, if God is the wisest person in the universe, if God created all of the universe for you and I to enjoy, and we are the, the pinnacle of his creation, then it makes sense that we should, when thinking about our own lives and the direction our lives are going, it makes sense that we should go to him and find out from him what he considers successful. If I'm going to live this life, I want to be, I want to be a success in God's eyes, not just in the world's eyes. Now in Matthew 7, 21, Jesus said this. He said, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Now that's a scary statement right there. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. Which poses the question, what is the will of his Father in heaven? John 15, 10. And verse 12, when you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. This is my commandment, love each other in the same way I have loved you. Jesus was obedient to his Father's commands, and as his followers, we're called to be obedient to his. What does that look like? All of the commands of Jesus revolve around loving God and loving God other people. Jesus, in fact, said, if you want to sum up all the commandments in the Old Testament, now, for some of you, you probably read the Old Testament and thought this is a little bit confusing. There's a lot of stuff in the Old Testament that doesn't actually uh, make all that much sense given our modern day context. But Jesus said, to sum up everything that's said in the Old Testament about serving God, there are two commandments. The first one is love God with everything that you've got. And the second one is just as important. Jesus said that. Just as important as loving God with everything you've got, he said, love your neighbour as yourself. Now, in 1 Corinthians 13, we're given a description of love that we all need to personalise in our own lives. There is no doubt in my mind that if you were to epitomise all of the characteristics of love that are mentioned in 1 Corinthians 13, then you will be able to stand before Jesus with total confidence in your heart. Now, because Pastor Gus isn't here today, I'm going to use him as my person. Um, but, it, but taking 1 Corinthians 13, chapter 13, the, what it says there about love, you need to put your own name in there and see whether you measure up to this. So I'm going to put Gus's name into it and see if he measures up to it and we'll discuss him because he's not here. No, that's, <laughs> I'll have a little bit of a chat about Gus. <laughs> but here we go. No, 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 I'm talking to him. He's watching this right now. You better be watching this, Gus. He's watching this. Well, he's not watching it right now, but he'll be watching it later. Okay, I'm going to personalise. I'm going to put Gus's name in there, but you put your name and see whether you measure up because this is the yardstick of success in the kingdom of God. Here it goes. Gus is patient. Gus is kind. He does not envy. He does not boast. He isn't proud. He doesn't dishonour others. He isn't self-seeking. He isn't easily angered. He keeps no record of wrongs. Gus doesn't delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. He always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Gus never fails. <laughs> See, well, I had to do it with somebody who wasn't here. <laughs> That's the benchmark. That's the descriptor for a successful life in the eyes of God. And God wants all of us to pursue that type of life here on earth. In fact, I would, I would probably I'd be as bold as to say that if you epitomise that type of life and you weren't a Christian then the people around you would think that you've lived a really successful life. The people around you would honour you, would honour your life, would say, that was a good person. God wants all of us to be successful in life, but how do you keep on loving when life throws curveballs your way? Because sometimes you just get a little bit tired of being kind. Sometimes you just get a little bit tired of going the extra mile. Sometimes you'd rather just stay in bed 
than come to church. Sometimes, and, and I shouldn't have put that in. But anyway, sometimes, you know, when, when, when Aunt Mary does that thing that she always does, you just want to tell her what you really think instead of just putting up with it. Sometimes you just get tired and you want to go and get a little shack on the side of a mountain overlooking some water somewhere and just check out of life. How do you keep on keeping on when all you want to do is become a grumpy old man? <laughs> to do that, to do that, we need to look at life differently. We need to look at life differently to the way the majority of people approach their time here on earth. We need an eternal perspective. I honestly think for, for me, when I look at life and I look at the long amount of times that I've spent in valleys, that having an internal ex perspective is kind of the only thing that makes sense of what I'm going through in, in various stages of life. There have been times when I've just looked at it and gone, this just isn't worth it. It's not worth it. And I don't see it actually resolving anytime soon. And it's only as I've had an eternal perspective that I'm able to, to just readjust and go, okay, I'm just going to keep on keeping on. I'm going to get up next day. I'm going to do what I know that I have to do. I'm going to continue to be faithful. We need an eternal perspective if we are to handle some of the things that life throws at us and continue to love right through to our very last breath. When we simply look to the here and now, what benefits us most in the moment will dominate our thinking. And the pressure to do that which brings us the most pleasure or vindication will war against what is best for others. In 2 John 1, 8, the Apostle John, approaching the end of his life, wrote these carefully chosen words. He said, Watch out that you do not lose what you have worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. God wants to reward us fully. For that to be an option means, means there's the possibility of a partial reward and also no reward. In fact, Paul touches on this very topic in 1 Corinthians 3, 13 to 15, where he says, But on the judgment day, fire, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value. If the work survives, that builder will receive a reward. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved, but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. It's serious business. Paul likened our mission in life to the lead up that athletes go through preparing for the Olympic Games. Now, they didn't have the, well, they had the, the Greek Games back in the time of Paul. And Paul is alluding to those games in 1 Corinthians uh, 9, 24 to 27, when he says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not, will, that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. No, I beat my body and make it my slave, so that after I preach to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. One day, our lives are going to be examined, and how we have lived them will be scrutinized. 2 Corinthians 5, 6 to 10. Therefore, we are always confident, and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. We live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Now, a number of weeks ago, I preached a message on what is it that we will be judged on. And if you weren't here for that weekend, uh, it's, on, it's online, um, and I would really encourage you to listen to that message uh, because it talks about judgment. But just three things about that. We will be judged not for our sin. Christians will be judged not for our sin because we've already passed through that judgment. 
but we will be judged on how faithful we have been to our belief in him. The fruit of our belief is seen in our love for others. And the cross determines where you spend eternity. Your fruit determines how you spend it. Now, just jumping back to a scripture that we read out just a little while ago in Corinthians, and this is reading from the NIV rather than the New Living Translation, so it's slightly different. If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. We need to be building toward the eternal and not just the temporal. Every moment of our lives, we're building either for the temporal or the eternal. Now, this is important. When you act out of love, you are building something that will go on for eternity. So you think, well, how do I build something? How do I, how do I store up treasure for myself in heaven? The treasure that Jesus is talking about. Whenever you do a loving action towards someone else, you are, you are doing something that will last for eternity. Nothing else will. Now, there's nothing wrong with doing stuff for the temporal. I mean, if you didn't do stuff for the temporal, you wouldn't be dressed. You wouldn't have clothes. You wouldn't have a house. You, I mean, there's nothing wrong with wanting to renovate or to paint some walls at home. There's nothing wrong with wanting to um, progress in your career. But just remember, those things are temporary. They don't last forever. The issue is when you get focused or get consumed by that which is temporary. And forget about the things that are eternal. These three things remain, Paul said. Faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. So if you want to build today something that's eternal, do something loving for someone. Now, that could be prayer. Now, now I understand sometimes people in their situation, their life situation currently may not have all that much contact with other people, but you can still love other people. You can still support other people even if you don't have much contact with them. And prayer is an absolute winner in my books. My mother is in a nursing home in the uh, northwest of New South Wales. She's been there for a while now. Um, she's confined to her room because she has emphysema and can't move around all that much. But every day, and she said, I don't know why I'm still alive. You know, it's really, I talked to her just, just last week. I don't know why I'm still alive, but maybe it's because every day I pray for people. And I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, oh, I feel like a lousy Christian right now, Mum. <laughs> I'll have to start praying a bit more uh, for people. And she goes, you know, I, I just pray. I just pray for people. And I came away from that conversation feeling bad for my mum. Because um, she doesn't have a great quality of life at the moment. She doesn't have a lot of people around her. The only people that... that I mean, don't, she says to me, oh, I think they're lying to me here. <laughs> you know, like, she tells me all these stories about the nursing home she's in. Um, uh, my mother's not an angel, all right? She's not perfect. She's Irish. And so she, she has some things to say about the nursing home and some of the people who work there. Um, but, but, she, but she prays for people. She doesn't have contact. She's... Stuck in her room, doesn't have contact, but she prays for people. And you might be in a situation, a, a time in your life where you don't have much contact with people around you, but you can still do loving things for them. You can pray for them. You can pray for people. You can pray for our church. You can pray for the Christians that you know that are going through a tough time. You can support, you lift up uh, our community before God. You can pray for people that are just, I mean, you see things on the news and they're tragic and they're terrible. If, why don't you pray for them? Prayer makes a huge difference. Now, God, I sometimes think, well, God, you know, why don't you just sort everything out? And God's saying, well, why don't you just sort everything out? Yeah. I looked at the world and I saw there was famine. And well, God, why don't you sort that out? He said, oh, I'm waiting for you to do it. You know, you're the one that's there. Um, you can do, you can make a difference in our world by lovingly interacting with it. And what you do in love 
last for eternity. So love your family, love your work, workmates, love your school friends, love the people you come in contact with. Look to do loving things every single day. And every single day you'll be making a deposit in the bank of heaven. And you'll be storing up treasure for yourself where moth and rust can't impact on it. It will last for all eternity. Every moment of our lives, we're building either for the temporal or the eternal. Just make sure you're making regular deposits in those things that are eternal. How does eternity change our perspective on life? Does it cause us to rethink our priorities? If we live forever, that's what eternity tells us. If we live forever, what is the best use of our time here on earth? Now, contrary to popular opinion, life isn't short. It's actually the longest thing you've done so far. <laughs> But your time on earth, when compared to eternity, will become increasingly irrelevant in comparison to how long you will exist into the future. And that should help take a little bit of the pressure off some of the things that you're struggling with at the moment you think are just all-consuming. Compared to eternity, they're probably not all that important. What is important is, are you loving people? When I was when I was a young kid, I went along. I, we, I was, we, most of you, well, some of you that have been with us for a while, know that I grew up in a Catholic church. My parents were involved with the Franciscan um, friars. They were a, a uh, an order of brothers uh, that were formed by uh, Francis of Assisi, and um, we had a seminary or a monastery just down the road from where we lived. And we used to go up there all the time as kids. And we used to hang out, and there was a brother there that I got to know. Um, Great, great fellow. Nothing bad happened, all right? Just, you know. It was a great guy. Lovely, lovely fellow. And I remember sitting down with him one day, only as a kid, and I, I, probably about 12 or 13, and I asked him about eternity. I said, oh, how do you, what is, what's eternity? I mean, it's really hard when you're, when you're young. You know, you think that one year is eternal. You know, it's like waiting for Christmas. It takes forever when, you, when you're a kid. Now Christmas comes around after a week or two, you know, every year. <laughs> but I said to him, what, 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 what is eternity? And he gave me this uh, word picture that some monk from year, hundreds of years ago had come up with. And, and this is it. This is so that you can begin to conceptualize what eternity is like. He said this, Imagine a ball of lead the size of the sun, and every hundred years a sparrow flies past and brushes its wingtip against it. Eternity is how long it takes that ball of lead to be worn away. <laughs> so every hundred years a sparrow flies past that ball of lead, brushes its wingtip against it. Eternity is how long it takes for that ball of lead to be completely worn away. Away, and then we know that if it's eternal, if it's eternity, it goes even further than that. If you could transport yourself a thousand years into your future, what would be your thoughts on your time here on earth? Would you be happy the way you set things up? For your eternal future. Because it is important what we do here on earth. What we do on earth determines how we enter into eternity. So it's important. So if you're able to jump a thousand years ahead and look back over your life, would you be happy with what you have been doing? Would you be happy with the way you have set things up? Would you be happy with the investment that you've been making in eternal things? Or would you look back in your life and go, I had an opportunity and I kind of blew it. I had an opportunity to really set things up well and I focused on things that weren't particularly important. What would it do for your courage? I mean, it's always easy to be brave after the fact, isn't it? It's kind of like you're scared stiff coming up with something, like public speaking. The first time you ever had a public speak, you're scared stiff. The fact of the matter is you get through it and you live, you know, it doesn't kill you. But you feel like you're dying. 
And it's always easy to look back on stuff and be brave. It's, who's ever had one of those conversations in their head? If I could go back in time and I was back in that situation, I would say this. <laughs> I wouldn't be quiet this time. I would open my mouth and I'd let them know exactly what at the time I was like. Oh. You know, it's always easy to be brave in hindsight. The trick with life is being brave in the present. And I find one of the ways that gives me the intestinal fortitude to make the right decisions now is to do a little exercise in my head where I jump forward into the future and I turn around and I look back at this decision that I've got to make right in the moment and I speak to myself from the future. And I always say to myself, well, you're going to live through it. You're not, it's not going to kill you. So make sure you don't say anything that you're going to regret. Make sure you don't do anything you're going to regret. Do the right thing because you're going to really be glad you did in 10, 15 years' time. And it's always helped me to have courage in the present. But what about our lives when we consider eternity? And this is why I think this question is something that we need to be reminded of every now and again. Because it helps to put everything in perspective. It helps you to realise that that long valley that you're going through that may, may end up lasting all the way till you die is still okay. It's not the end of the world. You don't have to lose all hope because that's not the way the story ends. When you step off this planet and see Jesus and realise that he is really, truly in control of everything and that he has a plan and a wonderful future for all of us, then it makes all of the suffering that we go through here on planet Earth manageable. And the key thing that we need to be managing as we go through life is what it is that we're focusing on. Are we focusing on the eternal, which is loving other people? Or are we focusing just simply on the temporary, which is my current comfort at this particular point in time? Or the house reno? Or my career advancement? What is it that we're focusing on? Thank you.